Okay, today we are talking about doctrines of the sacraments and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, next week, of course, is the last week. We will be talking then about the doctrine of the future, or eschatology as it's called. And then we will have the final exam. As always, I encourage all of you to take the final exam, uh, because I think it's part of a learning experience. But if you're not doing it for credit, you don't have to. Um, let's talk first about the sacraments. Um, I'm going to give you four different definitions for sacraments, starting with one that's purely secular and sort of working down through it, because there's a very different understanding amongst the Christian churches in the world, particularly Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Protestantism, about what a sacrament is and what constitutes a sacrament. The most secular or general of definitions might be a sacrament is a religious action or symbol in which spiritual power is believed to be transmitted through material elements or the performance of ritual. You can tell that was not written by Christian. Um, now, it's important though for us to say that because human nature is such, and I believe that this is in response to how God has made us, human nature is such that we have an inherent sense that there are things that we can do that can put us in touch with the sacred. And the idea of using ritual in order to be able to uh, affect the spiritual world, if you will, is very ancient. To the extent that rituals of various kinds have been used to try to influence events in the natural world, weather, crops, the birth of a child, have been uh, used to try to affect a blessing from the divine, whatever perspective of divine it is. So this idea of a sacrament as being a material or physical action that had spiritual significance goes back to the most ancient of times before any organized religion that we know of today. So this is the most secular of definitions. Now, I'll say at this point that the word sacrament comes from a Latin word, uh, sacramentum, which means to consecrate or to make holy. The idea is, within a sacrament as we understand it, we take something, an action or materials, and we, by committing ourselves in faith, we turn that into something that is sacred or holy. It comes from another Latin word, uh, uh, sacer, which means um, sacred or holy. You'll hear talk of sacerdotal. The word sacerdotal means priestly or having to do with priestly activities, the holiness of activities of the sacerdotal um, thing. So, sacrament. A second definition for sacrament would be a sacred Christian rite recognized as of particular importance and spiritual significance. Now, you'll notice that it is a Christian rite in this case, and that it is of spiritual significance. I say here that this is reflective of Orthodox tradition. The reason being, and I'll talk about this later, the Orthodox churches, both Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox churches, um, accept the seven sacraments that the Roman Catholic Church proposes. But, they have a very different idea about what a sacrament is. They don't limit it to those seven. <laughs> they say that in addition to those seven sacraments, anything the church does as the church is sacramental. Could you perhaps ask him to step outside? It's pretty loud. Um, anything the church does as the church is considered sacred and therefore is sacramental. And so uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more, some of the other things that the Orthodox churches perceive as being additional sacramental kind of acts, okay? So, a sacred Christian rite recognized as of particular importance and spiritual significance. A third definition, which is the definition that comes from the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is that a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. And again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. The Catholic Church believes that all grace is accessed, accessed through the sacraments. Apart from receiving of the sacraments, you cannot receive grace, and so therefore you cannot be saved. Uh, the Catholic Church maintains that without baptism, without the taking of the Eucharist and other, uh, other of the, uh, particularly baptism, other of the sacraments that they hold, that you cannot be a Christian. So that's why the divine life is dispensed to us. I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. Um, another definition, actually I have five, I told you four. Another definition for, for us, 
um, which is the, ang the official Anglican, or at least part of the official Anglican definition, but it's also used by a lot of Protestants uh, other than Anglicans. And it's funny, some Anglicans call themselves Protestants, some don't. One of the local Anglican priests was adamant to me that he is absolutely not a Protestant. So, um, so that varies. When I pointed out to him that the, the uh, theology of the Anglican Church was clearly and obviously Calvinist, he sort of hung his head a little bit and then conceded that point, but he still didn't like the idea of being Protestant. So, sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace which is ordained by Christ himself. The first part of that you may have heard, because that is a common definition for sacrament amongst Protestant churches, an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. We'll come back to some of that. And then the fifth definition I would give you is that a sacrament is a rite or ceremony instituted by Jesus and observed by the church as a means of or a visible sign of grace. That says sort of the same thing, but in different words. You know, that's the, that is that um, that definition comes from the I think it's the Westminster Confession. Okay. So you get the idea. It is a, a an act that we perform using materials that are available in the world, but to which are assigned a significant spiritual effectiveness. Okay, Carolyn. Um, the instituted by Christ is a, is confusing to me, in, uh, particularly in the Roman Catholic definition. If, yeah. if holy matrimony is a sacrament, Jesus didn't marry anyone, or you know, by marry anyone, put same a question. couple together. <laughs> What's that? Wed. Yeah. Same question. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. I'm sure you Which is exactly why the reformers didn't want have ah. didn't like having seven sacraments. Now they the Catholic Church says all of them were instituted by Christ. For instance, matrimony. Jesus' first miracle was turning the water into the wine at the marriage at Cana, and in so doing, he blessed and instituted marriage as a holy thing. That's different from instituted. Okay, I'm not. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> but if we had you know a Catholic theologian up yeah. here, he would absolutely be insistent upon that. I would say instituted by God. I mean. But they say instituted by Christ. Wow. And in fact, it was exactly that. See, the Catholic Church had that kind of statement that all of the sacraments are instituted by Christ. Um, and, and we're going to look at those right now, what they are. Um, and the reformer said five of these were not instituted by Christ. <laughs> and so therefore, we're not going to hold those as sacraments. Right? So the question you asked, and then some of the others of you had as well, I'm sure, is exactly why Protestants don't have seven sacraments, why we only have two. And I don't know why we don't also have foot washing, which uh -huh. only a very few churches do, because Jesus washed the, the, the apostles' feet, and then he said, as I have done for you, do for one another. I've always been guilty about that. That clearly seems to me that ought to be a sacrament, because he told us to do it. Hmm. Okay. But the word instituted, doesn't that mean more than just done once? Institution. Well, he was only baptized once. Yeah. Jesus was only baptized once. Baptism was used multiple times. And his presence many times. Well, well the Lord's Supper was only practiced once while he was alive. And that was a commandment. Well, he commanded us about foot washing, too. It, you know, go back and read it. He said, you know, I, I'm still on the marriage one. Yeah. Well, I'm not, but, you know, I don't, that's why we don't believe in that. Okay, exactly. Well, let's, okay. let's talk about the fact that Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and some Anglicans, those Anglo-Catholics, again, they float somewhere in the middle, they have seven sacraments, okay? Um, those sacraments are first Eucharist, or Holy Communion, also called the Mass. You know why it's called the Mass? Um, because in the Catholic Church, non-Catholics are allowed to participate in the service up to the point of Communion at which point they are dismissed. And the word dismissed in Latin became mass. So that's the point where those who are not baptized members of the Catholic Church are dismissed and cannot participate in that part. Okay? So the first of those is the Eucharist or Holy Communion. The second is baptism. The third is confirmation which is baptism, of course, is for children. Confirmation is when, as an adult, a profession of faith is made and that person is confirmed. Now, confirmation often happens at a set age in many Catholic communities, um, you know, the First Communion kind of experience. 
then penance, which is confession and you know confession of sin and the work done to it uh, to deal with that. Now, let me say a word about that. We mentioned that in the Bible study today. Penance originally was created to deal with a very specific problem in the Catholic Church, and that was during the times of persecution, some um, some Catholic Christians. Some Christians, there weren't Catholics and Protestants back then. Some Christians had denied the faith under either actual torture or torment or threat of torture or torment. Well, then after the persecution was passed, and especially once um, uh, Constantine made Christianity legal in the early 300s, the question before the church was, a lot of these people that had denied the faith and had rejected Christ in order to keep from being um, persecuted, came back and said, we only did it because we had to. We really believe in Jesus. We want to come back. And the church was really torn. And I mean, in some cases, torn apart. There were people thrown out of offices, you know, meaning uh, church offices and things like that, over this issue. And some of them said, you know, we have to take them back if they profess faith. Others said, absolutely not. There are clear passages in the New Testament that hold out to the end, and if you do, you'll get the reward. The assumption being, if you don't hold out, under persecution, then you are not part of the elect. And so you had these two halves of the church that were fighting over this. What they finally came up with is that they would allow people back in, but before they would do so, they had to do something to demonstrate their sincerity of truly wanting to be part of the church since they had rejected Jesus earlier. And so the whole uh, approach of penance, the doctrine of penance as a way to demonstrate sorrow for past sin, especially for apostasy originally, and it became for all sins, and to demonstrate that one truly is sincere and one to come back to the Lord. So that's how penance came about. We're always so quick to say that's really wrong and stupid and not biblical and everything else. Well, it was a very real situation the Catholic Church was trying to deal with that led them to that. It doesn't mean I advocate penance today, but we need to understand that there, there were very real historical reasons for some of these things to come to be. Uh, next is anointing of the sick or extreme unction. It was known as extreme unction until the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. And at the Second Vatican Council, they changed extreme unction to anointing of the sick. And so technically, it's not referred to as extreme unction. Extreme unction had to do specifically with uh, anointing of someone at their point of death in order for them to receive grace and therefore be forgiven of the sins that they were carrying right before the moment of death. Anointing of the sick can happen anytime, so it's been changed. Uh, matrimony or marriage is a sacrament. And ordination or holy orders, that is ordination to the priesthood or to a monastic order. Now, <clears throat> these, um, these seven sacraments, according to the Catholic Church, are all received as a means of grace ex opere operato. Somebody want to tell me what that means? Okay. Ex opere operato means by the very act of it. By the very act of administering the, uh, the sacraments, by the performance of receiving them, that in itself is a means of receiving grace. In other words, now they do say that if the recipient actively opposes this. In other words, if they're lying and they don't really believe it, if there's something in them that is actively against what is happening and what they're saying, then it doesn't work. But it does not require any particular act of faith. Unless they're actively opposing it in some way, then it is considered efficacious. So just by the act of taking the elements, it is said that grace is received, no matter what's happening inside the person. That is not the Protestant belief. The, the, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about the Protestant um, sacraments. The belief is that the Protestant sacraments are an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And if you do not have the faith, if you do not receive these things in faith, if you do not allow them to be administered to you in a spiritual, more than a physical sense, then they are not efficacious for you according to Protestants. Meaning they don't, they don't help you at all. They don't, you don't have any benefit from them. Now, this is very consistent if you remember last week's class on the, the doctrine of the church. That the Catholic Church has historically seen the visible church as the real church. 
The very existence of a hierarchy, the magisterium, the physical presence of the church is what the church is. In the same way that the physical, visible offering of the sacraments is what causes it to work. <laughs> Whereas Protestantism has fall, have fallen, uh, Protestants have fallen much more back on the idea of the invisible church and therefore on the invisible effect of the sacraments on us spiritually. Does that make sense? So there is a consistency there. And this is why we, we don't agree with that. Um, now, amongst the, the Orthodox Church, again, the Orthodox Church agrees with all of these seven sacraments. Uh, they don't usually call them sacraments. They call them the mysterion, which means the sacred mysteries. <laughs> And in doing so, the sacred mysteries, they're allowed to have other things that they believe, as I said before. Anything the church does as the church is considered sacramental. For instance, the burial of the dead, the consecration of the church, um, the, the confirmation of somebody in monastic orders, like the, the monastic tonsure, you know, when they cut the hair of a funny thing, that's considered a sacrament, or at least of the same import as a sacrament. It's a sacramental act, if you will, according to the Orthodox Church. Um, which is, again, I, I, I've talked about before the fact that liberal theology did not affect the Catholic Church because they wouldn't allow it. it. And it did not affect the Orthodox Churches because they don't think that way. There is much more of a sense, a much greater willingness on the part of the Orthodox Churches to accept something as a mystery. For instance, the Catholic Church has gone to great length in its history to identify exactly what the sacraments are and exactly what happens when you take them and at what instant do the miracles occur, at what, you know, at what precise act, point in the act do you receive grace. And, there, and the rituals of the Catholic Church reflect that. For instance, during the communion or the Holy Eucharist or the Mass. If you've ever been in a high church Mass, you will remember, perhaps, that at the point at which the elements are being blessed, the cup will be elevated. And at that point, there will be a bell or a gong. That is seen as the exact instant in which that cup is no longer wine, but has become, literally, the blood of Christ. When they elevate the bread, and there is the sound of, the, you know, of that gong or bell, that is the instant at which that bread is seen to be transformed literally into the body of Christ. And so the Catholic Church has always had this very, a real concern knowing the exact instant and the exact process, very rationalistic. The Orthodox churches would say, why are you doing all that? It's a mystery. We don't know exactly how it happens or exactly when it happens. We just accept that it happens. Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, and we accept that. Why do you have to rationalize it all? That's what they would say to the Catholic Church. That's the same reason that the, that the uh, Orthodox churches didn't have a problem with liberal theology, because liberal theology is a rationalistic act. It's trying to come up with rationalistic academic explanations for everything. And the Orthodox churches said, we accept this stuff as mysteries. We don't have a problem. Bless you. I blew my water. <laughs> so literally, you did. I'm just teasing you. Uh, so you, you see that difference. And that, that's a fundamental difference in more an attitude than theology between the Orthodox churches and the Catholic churches. Yes? Does the Orthodox Church have the same kind of idea about um, sacraments being a means of grace as the Roman Catholic yes. Church? Yes. In fact, shockingly, so did Lutheran Calvin. Ah. Uh, not limited to those, but they did believe that there was a transmission of grace that occurred in the taking of the sacraments. Now, and so Orthodox also doesn't limit it to that's the only way you can get grace? Um, I don't know, okay. to be very that's, honest. That's kind of what I would ask. Yeah, right. I haven't, you know, my, my knowledge of the Orthodox churches is not as great as, okay. as Western churches. Um, whether they limit it to that, probably not, because they have with all that other exactly stuff that because they of had, the belief yeah. that anything the church does as the church is seen as sacramental. They probably are much more open to that. But again, while Calvin and Luther, and I'm getting ahead a little bit, while they said that um, there really was a conferral of grace that occurred when you when you're baptized or when you take the sacraments, 
it was still dependent upon the internal receptiveness of the person, not ex operate operato, and it was not limited to that. That ultimately those things were, were additional blessings or graces that we received after having received directly the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay? So they didn't limit it to that, but they did believe that grace was conveyed in the, in the cycles. Okay? Now, in, the, in 1543 to 1563, it actually meant for 20 years, the uh, Council of Trent met. It was the primary effort by the, uh, of counter-reformation by the Catholic Church. In other words, the Council of Trent was when the Catholic Church finally got their act together and decided we've got to do something about all of these, these protesting, you know, all the Lutherans and Zwinglians and Calvinists and everything else that had come along. And so the Council of Trent was the uh, Council of the Counter-Reformation. And so everything that came out of it was a declaration against what the Protestants were saying. That was the whole point of that council. And among the things they said, there were two of the canons that came out, or, uh, that came out of the Council of Trent. The first one, canon number one, says, if anyone says that the sacraments of the new law were not all instituted by Jesus Christ, by the new law, they mean the new covenant, you know, the Christian, uh, that they were not all instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord, or that they are more or less than seven, to wit, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, holy orders, and matrimony, or even that any one of these seven is not truly and properly a sacrament, let him be anathema. The word anathema means a curse. It means to be excommunicated and damned to hell. So they felt so strongly in reaction against the Protestant re reformers that they said, if you do not agree that all seven of these were ordained by Christ and all seven are true sacraments, then you're damned to hell. Okay? Um, and the reason is exactly why you guys asked that question. People said, matrimony? How is it Jesus instituted matrimony? Well, this was their reaction. Don't ask that question or you're damned to hell. <laughs> Oops. Canon number four, <laughs> boy, you guys did it. I'm not sorry. Uh, canon number four um, from the Council of Trent says this. If anyone says that the sacraments of the new law, again, that's the new covenant, that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary unto salvation, but superfluous, and that without them or without the desire thereof, men obtain, obtain of God through faith alone the grace of justification, Though uh, all the sacraments are not necessary for every individual, let him be anathema. In other words, if you say that you can be saved in any way other than by the taking of the sacraments from the church, you're damned to hell. Okay? That's how strongly they felt about it. Oh, excuse me, Ross, what was the year, the year of Council of Trent? 1543 to 1563. They met various, uh, various times over a 20-year period. Okay? How do you spell that word? I might use it when I'm speaking to somebody. Anathema. A-N-A-T-H-E-M-A. <laughs> -A -E it means accursed. But in, in the context of the Catholic Church using it, it, oh, means, then I won't use it. it meant excommunicated <laughs> and therefore damned. Okay. So, the Catholic Church had believed, but then absolutely affirmed to the Council of Trent, <laughs> that the sacraments were necessary for salvation, that they were the only way to receive grace, that you couldn't directly access grace because of the act of Christ, that it was only given through the church by the sacraments, believing that Christ gave them as for that very reason, that they were to be the means by which grace was delivered to believers. Okay? That's the Catholic doctrine of their seven sacraments. Okay. This, is, this is probably a dumb question. <laughs> I'll just keep asking dumb questions. You can't do all seven. You're either ordained or you're married, or even not married. So how, how does that well, work? Well, in fact, that? what it said, or what the Council of Trent said, if anyone says that without them or without the desire thereof, um, sorry, where, where is it? Uh, the, the, Kind of Though all the sacraments are not necessary for every individual. Oh, oh, it does say that. Okay. It does say that. That's okay. in canon number four. Gotcha. Um, and in other words, they, they, knew, they had to recognize you can't be married and be a priest. Okay? Um, and so they accepted that, but even though you may not be able to access all of them, the ones that you do have access to are necessary for your salvation. 
Chris. The sub anglicans that are listed yeah. there, they don't look at it that way, or do they? Uh, like, some of them would. The strictly so, Anglo Catholic. Ones. I see. Yes. So they're that close to the yeah. In fact, um, there have been uh, there have been times when the Catholic Church has accepted ministers, Episcopal or Anglican priests, into the communion of the church. They allowed them to keep their wives, which didn't go over great with some of the priests that were already in the Catholic Church. But part of it was that they had to agree with this. And so some of them do. Yeah. Yes, Lynn. Can a person who is Catholic be not ordained but be a minister within the Catholic Church? Or well, does there, that have totally different concepts? Um, Ordination in this case, holy orders, means priest, monk, or nun. And then as a priest, of course, they may be elevated to a bishop. Um, very rare cases where somebody is taken in straight as a bishop, and those were usually in, you know, very early in the history of the church. Uh, so that's what they mean by holy orders. The Catholic Church does have lay ministers of various kinds, you know, particularly women in lay ministry roles. But that's not what's ta being talked about when they talk about holy orders. The only holy order that a woman is eligible for would be the monastic order uh, of being a nun. Okay? All right. So that's what the Catholic Church has believed and maintained with some vigor, especially since the Council of Trent. So Protestants recognize only two sacraments. The most important of them, the core sacrament for the Protestant faith, is the Holy Communion, which again is sometimes called the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Divine Liturgy, or in the Catholic sense, the Mass. But that we're all talking about the taking of the body and bread as a representation of the blood and of the, of the taking the bread and wine as a representation of the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, um, that has always been considered amongst Catholics and Protestants as being the most important. That is, in fact, often when when people are speaking of this, they will say the sacrament, and they mean Eucharist, Communion. That's because it is above, above all others. And the one that Jesus was most clear and most adamant about uh, commanding us to proceed with. Okay. The second is baptism. Now it's interesting that uh, both of these, communion and baptism, do have roots in the ancient Jewish practices. Uh, in fact, baptism, there are, there are examples of, of ritual washing in a lot of ancient cultures. In, back, in the um, Jewish culture, many of the wealthier Jews would have pools for ritual washings right in their house. They're uncovering more of those sorts of things all the time in Jerusalem. They're still doing archaeological digs in and around Jerusalem. And the wealthier homes, they would have a, um, it has to be running water because it's supposed to be living water, which means it can't be, you can't just fill a tub. They would have to have access coming in from a stream or some other source and then wait for it to get out. In other words, it has to be moving. That's what they defined as living water. Well, a Jew for ritual washing before going to the temple or eating a meal or whatever would walk down steps into this and just dunk themselves and then come back up the steps on the other side. And that sort of ritual washing, which is still practiced today when a non-Jew uh, professes the Jewish faith. They have a ritual washing of cleansing for them. And so there was a model of that. That's where John the Baptist got his baptism. And so when Jesus initiated this, going to all the world, uh, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that was a continuation of something that had been given as a right to the ancient Jews, which was then updated, brought into the New Covenant. Right? Similarly, Holy Communion, while it was unique in the sense that it, uh, we perceive it as the body and blood of uh, God, literally, of Jesus Christ. Remember when it was practiced. It was done at the Passover. And so Passover, Seder suppers, even the, uh, the, the Sabbath meal, all of them have an aspect in which you are eating it as an act of uh, acknowledgement of God's blessing and of his presence, etc. Now again, Jesus took both of those and elevated them to a completely new level in terms of the spiritual import. But there were, there were models from the Jewish history that they were taken from. Now again, those are our only two. The Protestant reformers, starting with Luther and Calvin, Zwingli as well, although Zwingli had a very different idea, I'll talk about it in a minute. The Protestant reformers held that a sacrament had to be of divine institution, 
which meant it had to be both commanded and practiced by Jesus. Jesus was baptized, and you remember when he wanted to be baptized, he told John the Baptist to baptize him. John the Baptist said, what? You should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, go ahead, baptize me so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. It was understood that Jesus did that as an example for us to do the same. And then he commanded it in the Great Commission. Baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he both did it, and he commanded it. He participated in the Last Supper, the Communion, and he commanded them, as often as you shall, you know, eat of this, drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. So it was perceived that those two alone were really instituted by Jesus and commanded by Jesus. Jesus, being at the wedding of Cana, even if he did turn 900 gallons of water into wine, did not, according to the Protestant Reformers, or our belief today, constitute having ordained that, nor did he ordain holy orders. You know, when did he establish a monastic order, or when did he say, you're now a priest? Well, the Catholic Church says that when he said to Peter, you know, you are Peter the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, that he created the holy orders through Peter at that moment. And so for every one of these, they have a way of saying, this is how Jesus instituted this. You said that penance only started in like the second, third century. Though. As an official um, doctrine of the church, it, it began late first century, and you know they struggled with things, and then continued up into the third century, dealing with how do we, you know, how do we deal with these folks? Um, it was a, there were a lot of struggles because there were various persecutions. Every time a, a new major persecution would come along, Nero, Domitian, Diocletian, etc. This will be a problem the church had to address again. So they had to reverse engineer something to get to penance with Jesus? Well, I don't know how they explain that. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not a Catholic theologian. I'm not Sorry. A I'll theologian. just keep asking you. You'll keep you asking me questions. Does anybody else want to put me on the spot? <laughs> I want to know whether the when, when we take Holy Communion, do you only take it in your church, or can you take it? Like, well, that depends on who's delivering it. The Catholic Church, for instance, you have to be a Catholic to take it there. A lot of churches, you have to be a, a member of that denomination, and in many cases, a member of that congregation. Now, um, we, the Reformed tradition, which we maintain, and you'll hear me say this Sunday, if you come, <laughs> is... Um, you do, for, we believe in open communion, which means you do not have to be a Presbyterian. You don't have to be a member of our church. The only thing that's required is that you be a baptized believer in Jesus Christ. The believer in Jesus Christ is obvious. The baptized part is because baptism is the initiation of entry into the church. And I'm going to talk about that in, in a few minutes, about what the meaning of these things are. That, that, that's the, the act by which you become a church member. And, Communion or Eucharist is a rite that is um, that is given through the church. So you need to be a member of the church to receive it. And there are reasons for that. I'm going to have myself. No, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. No, I know that. But if I want to be Anglican church, I can take communion. Um, it depends on the Anglican church. I mean, if you go to this Anglican church over here, I'm sure they probably say fine. Yes. They're all welcome. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. Okay. Um, some Anglican churches, again, Anglican, the high Anglicans would say no. You know, unless you're unless you're an Anglican, you can't. Um, but there's a wide range of that. So some churches you absolutely can. Orthodox churches, uh, Catholic churches, you can. I don't think you can in an Orthodox church unless you remember the Orthodox church. If I went into a Catholic church and walked up and took communion, and they if they knew you were not a Catholic, they would say, "I'm sorry, no." Really? Yeah. I've actually seen that once. Hmm. What they did was they said, I'm sorry, no, and then uh, the priest put his hand on the person's head and blessed them, and then directed them back to their seat. Bob? Well, that's just what I was going to say. In some Catholic churches, you can actually go forward, and I don't know what the exact procedure is. I think you can crush your arms or something. Exactly. You don't have to take the sacrament, but the, plea, the priest can bless you. Exactly. Usually if somebody does that, if they, if they do it intentionally, the person I knew who did that, um, 
they didn't know the difference. They came up like this, but the thing, the person knew they weren't Catholic. And so, uh, but usually, if a person comes forward like this in the Catholic Church, that means they're not asking to take communion, but they are asking to be blessed. Okay. But even that differs from church to church. Um, so, Melanchthon, Melanchthon was the assistant uh, to Martin Luther, and he's the one that really took over the whole Lutheran Reformation after Luther's death. Uh, Melanchthon said that a sacrament are the, sacraments are the rites that have the command of God and to which is added a promise of grace. Okay. So, command of God means Jesus told you to do it, and that there, there is a sense in which they, they, we receive grace through those things. Calvin said it is an earthly sign associated with a promise from God. Simpler yet. Um, now, some Protestants today prefer the term ordinance to the word sacrament. Because sacrament, um, it was what was practiced by the Catholic Church, and again, it has a sacerdotal kind of suggestion that has a priestly uh, implication in the very word sacrament, to make something holy, to consecrate it. And uh, a lot of churches, particularly Baptists, for instance, will not use the word sacrament. They'll use the word ordinance because Jesus ordained us to do these things, meaning he told us to. Um, and so you do get some differences in that. Um, there are a number of churches that are legitimate churches who don't, have, who don't practice the sacraments at all. The Salvation Army, most people think the Salvation Army is just humanitarian. But the Salvation Army is a church. They have churches. They have ministers. And the Salvation Army does not practice the sacraments. And the reason is they say that they believe that our focus should be on real world kind of concerns with, with receiving holiness from Christ and expressing it in our concerns for others rather than in practicing of rituals. So they don't have a lot, a lot of uh, like sacramental ritual. Likewise, the Quakers don't practice the sacraments for a very similar reason, because they believe that our focus should be on, on the reality of experiencing Christ rather than the symbolic one. Um, and they, because they, they would perceive it as symbolic. Um, they, in fact, talk about the baptism and communion in the, in the Quaker church, but they do so in terms of experiences of Christ directly, not through an act. Uh, and the salvation, um, well, the, originally, the Lutheran Church, after, you know, when Luther said, no, we don't accept all seven, he had four. I'm sorry, he had three. <laughs> he had three, which uh, were communion and baptism, and Luther included holy absolution, which means the absolution from sins by a priest or minister. Uh, that continued for a long, long time, and some, some Lutheran bishops still practice absolution. In fact, while the Catholic, the uh, Lutheran Church rather, had the three sacraments, a lot of Lutherans then went back to two, like most other Protestants. But um, Lutherans from the very start have always accepted all seven of the Catholic uh, actions, but only considered either three when Luther was alive or two for most Lutherans now as being sacraments. The others simply being legitimate, you know, ritual actions of the church that are valid to practice, but don't. Are, don't communicate grace in some way. So they probably see matrimony and, and, and ordination and those things as being more significant than other Protestants would because they see them as very important processes of the church, but not as sacramental. Okay? Um, so even amongst the Protestants, there have been some differences. Um, any questions about any of that? Um, I've been talking from these notes and not, not flipping through. I mentioned the fact that, that foot washing, that Jesus, after washing the feet of the disciples, he then said, as I've done for you, do for one another. Uh, there are a few churches, the, um, the ancient and the Anabaptists, which don't exist as Anabaptists anymore. I mean, the Mennonites and some others came out of that. The, the Schwarzenau brethren, the German Baptist groups, there are a few who do practice foot washing as a sacrament for the same reasons that Jesus did it and he told his followers to do it. Um, there are, uh, well, I'm not sure how far I want to go with that. Let's talk about baptism and the Eucharist. I, you know, 
So do the Egyptians. Um, in the Protestant Church, we perceive baptism as being the act of public confession. That it is in, in our baptism, which should occur in public before the church, we see that as the place and time and way in which we are to profess our faith in Christ. And it is that that marks us as a member of the church. Now, baptism does not save you. The Catholic Church believed that you had to be baptized to be saved. Um, it, it is also true that with some Protestant groups, like some Baptists would say, if you are not baptized, in fact, if you're not baptized by full immersion, then you're not saved. I was saved in the Southern Baptist Church. On a Sunday night, I always say during the 29th singing of, the, of Just As I Am, and there are people in that church that believe that, and I was baptized the next Sunday. They, they want to get it done quick. Some of the people in that church I'm, would have said that if I had died in a car accident sometime during that week before I got baptized, they would have gone, boy, he got so close, but didn't make it. Because they believe that baptism by full immersion is necessary for salvation. And I did get dumped. Okay? Um, they believe that Jesus set the example with John the Baptist by entering into the water in full immersion. And that full immersion is the only means. Now, they go into great, great depths uh, of, of discourse to try to prove that the word baptize is from baptismo, which they believe means immersion. Well, a lot of scholars have said it doesn't mean immersion. It basically means, it can mean sprinkling just as well. Um, and so there is a difference there in terms of how baptism is to be performed. Most churches will accept that baptism uh, can be efficacious, it can be effective as, as a, a sign of membership in the church and profession of your faith, whether you're fully immersed, whether you're sprinkled, whether water is poured over you, and there are technical words for all of those things. Um, the, I've said, uh, we've talked before about a dear lady that was in our church, and, and we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit here in a few minutes. And um, this dear person would come to Carolyn on a regular basis and say, Carolyn, I do wish you were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Carolyn would say, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. And she'd said, so you speak in tongues. And Carolyn said, no, I don't speak in tongues. Well, the idea is you couldn't be filled with the Spirit if you weren't, uh, if you weren't, um, didn't speak in tongues. This same woman, I baptized a woman in our church by sprinkling. And she came up to me later, this dear woman, and said, you know, I would love to be able to go up to her and congratulate her on her baptism, but she hasn't really been baptized. If she's not fully immersed, she thought she's not really baptized. So there are a lot of differences. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? Or is it a, once you are saved, it is a public profession, uh, and the right by which you become a member of the church, is it necessary that it be by full immersion, or can it be by sprinkling? or a pouring of water. A third controversy having to do with baptism has to do with baptism of adults and baptism of infants. Um, a lot of the Protestant churches will say that they only believe in believer's baptism, which means a person has to be old enough to profess their faith in order to be baptized. Um, all of the early reformers uh, were in favor of infant baptism as well. And the idea is that baptism in the church today is um, parallel to what circumcision was to the Jewish people. And that is that it is a sign of entry into the people. In the Jewish case, it was the mark of being one of the people of uh, one of the Israelites, one of the, uh, one of the Hebrew people. In the case of infant baptism, it is seen as being the mark that this child, because of the faith and profession of the child's parents, is part of the church and it will be brought up in the church. That does not save the child. The child still has to reach the point at which they're able to make their own decision and profess their own faith before salvation occurs. Okay? And in fact, that's why the Catholic Church has, the, has baptism as a sacrament and also confirmation. Because confirmation is that point at which they declare their, their faith. Well, even in Protestant churches that practice infant baptism, there's a sense in which the baptism is a sign, as circumcision was, that this child is part of the body of faith. And it involves a commitment on the part of the parents and on the part of the congregation to raise that child in the church, since they are now part of the church, 
Um, but that child still has to reach the point where they make their own profession of faith. And there are differences on that. There, um, and you get completely opposite arguments about what was the New Testament stand, because the only specific examples we have of baptism in the New Testament are professing adults. But we do have uh, several references to whole families being baptized, which means that could have involved infants or small children. Uh, the Philippian jailer is one of them, etc. There are others. And so people argue back and forth about this. The Reformed tradition, which I'm part of, does believe in infant baptism, not for the sake of salvation. And my sense is, most of the people who oppose infant baptism, it's because I don't think they have a right understanding of what baptism is. Baptism does not save a person. It is simply the right of initiation for primarily into the church. That person still has to profess their own faith before any salvation happens. Okay. And so, to, quite often I think that's the difference that, that people stumble over. Yes, Lynn. In the Bible we read of Jesus being circumcised and being, uh, days later being taken to the synagogue uh, and presented. Is that um, sort of a Hebrew ancient way of uh, recognizing the child in front of God? Or is that just a part of the circumcision, uh, like the completion of the circumcision act? Or, or well, the, the idea was that a child would be presented and officially named. It's very, that's where we get the, the modern christening, where a child is brought to the church and presented and is blessed, godparents are named, and the child's name at that point, from a, from a church point of view, is officially given. So the presentation at the temple was very, very similar to what we understand as a christening, in which the child's name would be officially announced and recognized, and probably, you know, entered into the into the logs of the temple and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, there was not an inherent connection between that. That was just part of the rituals that they practiced. Just like, you know, Catholics will have christenings now, which is not, you know, it's it's a so okay. So water. That's. Baptism. Let's talk about Holy Communion. As I said, Communion really is the core, the most critical um, of whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Orthodox, the most important of the practices of our faith, the most important sacrament. It symbolizes the forgiveness of sins because it symbolizes the fact that Jesus gave his body and gave his blood on our behalf. Um, the bread and the wine in representing Jesus' body and blood, of course, that comes from the Last Supper. Um, and the, the nature of it, um, by the way, Eucharist, when we talk about Eucharist, comes from the word Eucharista, which means thanksgiving. It is an expression of thanksgiving to Jesus for giving himself for us, for giving us his body and blood. Now, the... Um, I mentioned last week as well, when we were talking about the church, that the Catholic Church officially has a sense in which there are two levels within the church. There are the lay people, and there are those who are the leaders, who the priests, the monks, the bishops, etc. And that in effect, the leaders are the real church. They're the ones that God has called, and everybody else gets to go along for the ride. Now, because of that sense of differences between the two parts of the church, there has been a long tradition of communion in one kind versus both kinds. And this was one of the big issues at the Reformation. Um, historically, in the Catholic Church, before there was a Protestant church, in the history of the church, only the priests could take both the body and the blood, the bread and the wine. And usually, part of that was done behind a screen called a root screen, which out of sight, and this is still true in, or, in a lot of the Orthodox churches, that the actual blessing of the elements and the, and the preparation of communion and the taking of communion by the priest is done out of sight. You're not allowed to even see it. And then the bread is brought out and given, and the, the lay people, the congregation, can participate by eating of the bread, but they don't get to take the wine. One of the big issues that the Reformation had to deal with on, on the whole communion or Eucharist issue was the taking of the body and blood, the taking of communion in both kinds. 
This is one of the reasons that it was, it's linked to the idea that Luther maintained that got carried through the Reformation of the priesthood of all believers. If all believers are priests, then everybody has a right to take communion of both kinds. That was one of the ramifications of the priesthood of all believers that Luther and others advocated. There's not a special class of people that get to, to take communion of both kinds, and then we all get just, you know, just part of it. Um, and so that was, that was critically important. There have been a lot of differences theologically in terms of interpreting what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, broken for you, as often as you shall eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood, poured, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, as often as you shall drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. He did not say, this represents my body or this is symbolic of my blood. How to understand that has been a huge difference amongst Christian groups. The Catholic Church has interpreted that very literally in terms of the doctrine of transubstantiation. That means at that moment of blessing, when the elements are elevated, and this, the gong or the bell is heard, that that, even though the, visibly you can't see a difference, the body, uh, the bread does literally become the body of Christ, and the wine does literally become the blood of Christ. That is the doctrine of transubstantiation. This is the reason why none of the elements are ever poured out, why priests have to eat all of any of the communion bread or wafer or whatever that's left, they have to eat it. Any of the wine that's left, they have to drink it. Um, that's, that's because this is literally the body and blood of Christ to the Catholics. Now, Luther struggled with that theologically, but in principle he wanted to believe it. In fact, there's a period of time in which uh, Luther got together with Spingley. This is before Calvin was really on the scene. Calvin was a next generation reformer. They got together, the Swiss reformers and the German reformers got together to talk about can we join forces? And as I remember correctly, there were like 10 points that they felt they needed to resolve. They resolved nine of them. The 10th one was the nature of the body and blood of Christ in the communion elements. And they could not agree. Spingley maintained that these are, because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, Spingley insisted that these were a memorial. They were symbolic. Luther, the story is told that at this meeting, the whole time Spingley and his people are talking about what they believe, Luther is sitting there with his beer mug, pounding it on the table going, this is my body, this is my body, this is my body. And they couldn't even talk about it. So Luther, while he didn't like the doctrine of transubstantiation, I think he's just sort of waffled here. Uh, sorry, any Lutherans in the group. But Luther developed the doctrine of consubstantiation, which says that the, body, that the bread and wine don't literally become the body and blood, but that the, the body and blood of Christ, the, the spiritual essence of it, is over, under, around, and through. Okay. Um, and that kept the Swiss reformers and the German reformers from being able to work together. That one doctrine. Now, the idea of... of Consubstantiation, whether we use that word or not, has become, in, in a little more reasoned way, I think, the standard doctrine for many, um, for Calvin and for many Protestant churches. There's another word that I picked up in seminary, which I think accurately describes what, it is, what Luther was trying to say and what most of us believe today, and that is the word transsignification, which means that when the body, uh, when the bread and wine are blessed. And we say, as often as you take this in faith, you eat the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, that those elements, while they don't change from being bread and wine, or grape juice, depending on your church, they take on all of the spiritual significance. They literally change in significance to having as much significance of it as if it literally were the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, so... They don't, they don't change in substance, transubstantiation, they change in significance, transsignification, which I think is what Luther is trying to get at when he said over, under, around, and through. Um, and so we, you know, we say that as often as you take these elements in faith, so the faith of the person is the critical thing. 
then you eat the very body and blood of Jesus Christ until he comes again. All right. So that's the usual doctrine, certainly amongst Reformed churches, amongst a lot of other churches. But some churches today will follow Spingley's idea that they're simply symbolic. They're simply a, a memorial to Jesus' sacrifice. I had a, a dear friend of mine who was a Christian one time, you know, back, you know, young, cocky, you know, kind of, which we all were. And he said, you know, I can have communion just as meaningfully with a hot dog and a Coke in a park as I can you know, in a church. And I'm like, no, you can't. There's a certain sense in which there are aspects that must be present for a sacrament to be a sacrament. And one of them is the physical elements, which you have to have some respect for. One is the spiritual presence of Christ in it. And third is the sense in which those two things come together as we partake. Hot dogs and cokes don't cut it, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if that's all you had, and you had a sincere desire to experience Christ through communion, and you literally had nothing else, and you did it in faith, then okay. But I think what he was saying is, ah, it doesn't really matter. It does matter. This is important stuff. Anytime we talk about the body and blood of Christ, the significance of that, but it doesn't matter whether it's literally changed or not, but if we're talking about the significance of what Jesus did for us, we don't do that cavalierly. Okay, is that fair? Any questions about the sacraments? Okay, let's this of the Holy Spirit. Just one, one thing. Sure. Who can baptize? Um, again, it depends upon who you're talking to. In almost every case, now, there, there are some Protestant denominations that would say anybody can. Um, but in most cases in the, in the churches, Catholic or Protestant, they would say that an ordained minister. Uh, in fact, in the Presbyterian Church, for instance, and this is not uncommon, any Presbyterian model pretty much, as a minister, my official title is an elder of the word and sacrament. The other elders in our church are lay elders. My, it, it means I'm an elder like they are. We're equals. But I have certain responsibilities for proclaiming the word and for administering the sacraments. And I have been supposedly you know, trained and prepared for that. Now, there are some people, some groups that say anybody can baptize. In fact, I had a, I had a controversy, not a controversy, I had a disagreement um, with a church. I was doing some consulting with a church down in Southern California, and they were a, a church that started from the minister and his wife and another couple, and now they've got, you know, 800,000 people in it. I mean, it's one, one of those churches, okay? Huge church, multiple services. They've got a, a giant band that plays on Sundays. Well, they um, they have no link to any historic traditions. You know, Baptist, Presbyterian, anything. They're completely independent. And while we technically as a church are independent, we specifically say that we look to the historic polity and principles and traditions of the Presbyterian Church, okay? PCUSA. They told me the story, one of their elders, they had four elders and the pastor, and one of their elders told me, yeah, my wife came to me, she's part of a women's, uh, women's study group, and several of the women had never been baptized, and they wanted to be baptized, but they didn't want anybody to know about it. They were feeling bashful, and they wanted to keep it just to their group. And so this woman came to her husband, who's an elder in the church, and said, is it okay if we baptize each other in the swimming pool with nobody else there and not tell anybody. And he said, sure, that's fine. <laughs> what is baptism supposed to be? It is a public profession of faith. And it is supposed to be done after you know what you're doing. Again, you can't worship the Mother Gaia and then get baptized in a Christian ceremony. And it's supposed to be done by people who know that and have gone to the trouble of figuring out, do they know that? Mm -hmm. So to be baptizing each other in a swimming pool with the specific intent of nobody else knowing about it violates every principle behind what that sacrament is supposed to be. And yet, her husband, the elder, told her it was fine. Okay? That's why we need to know this stuff. Not that I have strong feelings about that. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to start out with something that's going to probably surprise you, because most of you know, you know the gifts of the Spirit from 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm going to tell you first about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to the Catholic Church, which everyone receives 
at the moment of baptism. This is not according to Paul, either in Romans or in Corinthians. This is according to Isaiah. All right? The Catholic Church has always maintained there are seven gifts that are given. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you Isaiah 11 in a minute, but I can only show you one slide at a time. Those seven gifts are wisdom. Now, wisdom ranks among the highest of all the gifts listed here because wisdom gives us the ability to see things the way God sees them. I'm mean, giving you the traditional understanding and why this is what the Catholic Church says of the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. Wisdom, the capacity to see things as God sees them and to love spiritual things more than material things, for instance. Secondly, understanding. Understanding is the gift that gives us the ability to uh, have deeper insights into the mysteries of the Christian faith that we can comprehend what we need in order to live as a follower of Jesus. The third is counsel, which means right judgment. It gives us the intuition that we need for doing the right thing under difficult circumstances. It basically helps us understand the difference in right and wrong. Okay? The fourth gift is fortitude or courage. It's basically the gift of strength and steadfastness that we need to be able to obey God's will at all times, even when it's hard. Um, and it's what allows us to overcome our fear. We were actually talking about that in, in uh, Bible study this morning. It's amazing how often things cross over between those two. The, the fifth is knowledge. Um, the, with the gift of knowledge, we're able to discern and discover what God, God's will is for us um, and be able to judge the things in our life in a way that has a divine perspective. Uh, it means we understand the things of God. Now, Protestant, especially Pentecostal, views of some of these things like knowledge or word of knowledge, as is often spoken of in charismatic terms, is very different. And I'll talk about that. Piety is the sixth gift, or reverence. Piety is the thing that allows us to have an instinctive love for God, to desire the things of God, to have a sense of respect and reverence for God and for His church, which is the body of Christ. And finally, the fear of the Lord which is to have wonder or awe at the sense of who God is, and also to have a legitimate dread of sin and of offending God. Not so much because of a fear of punishment, but because of a fear of offending a righteous and holy God. Those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit according to the Catholic Church, and it is based upon this scripture verse. Isaiah 11, 1-2, it is clearly a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about the coming of Jesus in Isaiah. And it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, meaning, you know, um, from Jesse, who was David's father in the lineage of David. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and you will delight in the fear of the Lord. This list of attributes that the Spirit has, because the Spirit comes upon those people who are who believe in Christ, or are elect, are saved, then it's believed by the Catholic Church that all of these enter into a person when they are saved, when they make a profession of faith, particularly in the Catholic Church, they would say when you're baptized since that's necessary for your salvation. That you receive all of these things. Okay, you receive wisdom, understanding, right judgment, fortitude or courage, knowledge, piety, and the fear of the Lord. And then our habitual sin wanders in and we still struggle with things. Okay? I think that is at five or six. Well, yes, and they believe that then as they grow up in the church, they will experience these as they gain the maturity to be able to practice them. Okay? Or if someone is is a, an adult, you know, becomes a believer as an adult and is baptized at that point, then it enters, the Spirit enters into them and brings all of this at that point. Yes, John? Um, I, I hate to bring this up, but your, your uh, piety mm -hmm. in, in Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, right. where, where did you see that? Um, piety or reverence is understood as being the... the um, is it the delight in the fear of the Lord? Well, actually, the... the the, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord is seen as piety or reverence, and then they restate fear of the Lord, and they say that's the dread part. That's how that's interpreted. Okay. Okay. Um, I might not have interpreted it the same way, but I didn't make this stuff up. Um, so. so you get the idea. So the, the, the Catholic Church has always seen these seven, I'll go back to that, these seven as being the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
because they're the characteristics of the Holy Spirit which are imbued upon believers once they are saved and accepted. Now, the church has done a lot over the years in terms of linking these uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit with, for instance, the holy virtues. You know, there's seven deadly sins and seven holy virtues. And so the holy virtues, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, um, are linked to the intellect and to some of the virtues related to the intellect. Fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord are linked to the will and how we practice the will, which are also linked to the virtues. For instance, Thomas Aquinas said wisdom, the gift of wisdom, links to the virtue of, of charity. The gifts of understanding and knowledge correspond to the virtue of faith. The gifts of counsel or right judgment correspond to the virtue of prudence. The gift of fortitude corresponds to the virtue of courage. The gift of the fear of the Lord corresponds to the virtue of hope. And of reverence corresponds to the virtue of justice. My point there is that the Catholic Church has done a lot with developing theologies around this. That this is the understanding the Catholic Church has had about the gifts and spirit. Now this is not the same list that most Protestants think of when they think of the gifts and spirit. It is true. Some of them are. Some of them are on that list. But we don't deny the fact that this is, these are seen as the characteristic virtues or, or uh, gifts that the spirit himself has and that he imbues on others. That's true, but we have much more of a tendency to focus on the gifts of the Holy Spirit as found in the writings of Paul, particularly 1 Corinthians 12, actually 12, 13, and 14 are all about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 about love really is about the gifts of the Spirit as well, because he says in there, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, so it's kind of an interlude about love in the, in the discourse between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14 about the gifts. So let's look at some of those passages, and then we'll talk about the, the more commonly understood Protestant version of what we mean when we talk about gifts of the Spirit. From 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 6, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one who says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are different, here we go, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work. And we continue. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Notice. Every Christian is given one or more gifts of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of serving others. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Now you are all the body of Christ. I've skipped to the end of uh, later in chapter 12 now. You are all the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, I'll come back around to some of the other stuff, but at this point I want to say that when he says um, earlier that the Holy Spirit distributes gifts to each one, each that's each Christian, just as he determines. And then he goes through this long list, saying, does everybody have the gift of being an apostle or a prophet or a teacher? Does everyone have the gift of miracles? Does everyone have the gift of healing or tongues or interpretation of tongues? Clearly, the answer is no, right? The point he's making is that everybody doesn't have the same gifts. This is why I don't believe that 
everyone has to speak in tongues in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, in order to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Tongues is one gift. And this clearly indicates to me that not everyone is going to have that gift. The reason why tongues is common wherever in the book of Acts, for instance, there's a sense in which God wants to make sure everybody understands that the Holy Spirit is present. He uses what is perhaps the most dramatic and most visible of all the gifts, and that is speaking in tongues. If somebody were prophesying or teaching, if somebody were healing, it would be easier to miss that or just see it as a human thing. Somebody starts speaking in miraculous languages that nobody understands or that only one person out of a crowd understands in the case of the second act, the second chapter of Acts, people notice that. And so God used that every time he needed to make a point of saying, I am here in your midst, inside you. That's why the second chapter of Acts and other places, that's the case. I believe Paul is making it very clear that not everybody has the same gifts. And the churches that say everyone must speak in tongues as a sign of the filling of the Spirit, I don't believe that's scriptural. Okay? Now, let's go back. Um, to each one is uh, given the Spirit for the common good. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not given just for our sake. Although Paul does say in 1 Corinthians 14, if you speak in tongues, that's for your edification. In other words, there is a blessing that comes in being able to pray in a Holy Spirit language. But, Paul says, I would, if I, in the context of the church, I'd rather speak five words, he says, that people can understand, than 10,000 words that nobody can understand. So either don't speak in tongues or have an interpreter there if you're in a public, you know, a, a worship gathering. He's very clear about that. Because the gifts, in almost every case, with that exception of tongues being for personal edification as well, they're for building up others in the life of the faith or for service of others. Okay? Usually, God gives us gifts of the Holy Spirit that are um, consonant with or consistent with what our natural abilities and talents are. Okay? Um, if somebody has a, a warm, outgoing personality, the gift of hospitality seems a natural for them. And yet, having a warm, outgoing personality and liking to entertain is not the same thing as having the gift of hospitality. The gift of hospitality is a miraculous gift that you have the ability to make people feel comfortable and at home and welcome. And then you, bring, you put people at ease. But often those things go together, all right? Um, but not always. Quite unusually, in Scripture, we have a number of examples where somebody's natural abilities or natural tendencies, or even their natural background, is not consistent with the miraculous gifts they're given. For instance, mm -hmm. Moses, in Peter's example, Moses was a stutterer, apparently. He had a speech impediment. What does God do? I want you to be my mouthpiece. And only after Moses complained about it a bunch, did he say, okay, I'll send Aaron, your brother, along, and he can do the talking, but you're still my guy, so shut up and get ready. Okay. Um, who he was and what his gifts were were not how God chose to use him. David was a poor shepherd boy, and he became the most important and powerful king in the whole history of the nation of Israel. Fishermen became apostles who wrote the very word of God for us. Which is why liberal theologians are always saying, oh, the, you know, these books couldn't possibly have been written by the apostles. They were dumb fishermen. Well, forgetting the fact that they had 20 or 30 or 40 years between the time they were dumb fishermen and the time they wrote those books, in most cases. Um, and so God usually uses the gifts, the natural gifts that we have, and complements them or, or furthers them with a miraculous giving of the Holy Spirit. But not always. Either way, God can use us. And every Christian has one or more spiritual gifts. Anybody who says, oh, no, not me, I don't have a gift. Yes, you do. And you need to be practicing that gift for the sake of the body of Christ. John. I have a question, Russ. Um, I assume that's why you raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, when, when one regards the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we understand this is for... For building up others, it is a tool. It is to encourage, serving up, to strengthen, yes. and edify. 
And the idea that each person has a particular gift, um, I understand that, um, and, and I concur with that, but let me present a different angle, and I need your opinion on this. Okay. What if it was a situation, and could it be a situation, where all of the gifts are resident in the Holy Spirit? And if you embrace the Holy Spirit, walking with Him in the in intimacy that He deserves, He would distribute those gifts separately as He wills in whatever situation that arises. A man who has the gift of tongues, if somebody's poor on the side of the street, they don't need a prophetic message. Or, you understand what I'm saying? Right. If somebody's sick, uh, they probably don't need hospitality, they need the gift of healing. So how, how, how would that fit? Could that, could that be possible rather than conclude that each person has one gift that he's kind of stuck with the rest of his life? Yeah, I didn't say one. I said one or more. One or more. Well, see, the, the tendency is to think that I'm limited to those. Yeah. So would you comment on that? Is that possible to... Yeah, a couple of things. One, I believe that the Holy Spirit can empower a person for a circumstance or a situation as needed beyond any any discussion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, that God strengthens and enables as needed for a situation. That's not the same thing as gifts of the Holy Spirit. The very, the very discussion of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is such that someone is gifted in a way, you can put your hand down, I'll call on you. <laughs> We've been through that with a couple of people. Um, the, um, the, the Holy Spirit gives us gifts for a, um, a long-term benefit, okay? I don't think people get the, the gift of prophecy, and that doesn't mean telling the future. The gift of prophecy, remember, you'll remember from other classes, a prophet is one who speaks the word of the Lord. The gift of being able to speak the word of the Lord, it may happen on a one-off kind of thing because there's a special circumstance in which God wants to speak to people, but, but experience, and what Scripture seems to talk about, is that that gift is given to be practiced over a period of time. You know, the apostles were given the gift of prophecy. They were the spokespersons for God. It wasn't a flash and then it was gone. Okay, it was over a period of time. For the most part, the gifts of the Spirit as we talk about it, and again, a person can have more than one. I believe that I have more than one. Um, you know, I have, I have some of the, you know, the teaching and preaching kind of gifts, I believe. I also believe I have the gift of discernment. If somebody's blowing smoke at me, I, can, I always can tell. And that's the ability to discern spirits or truth from falsehood. Um, and I'm not bragging about that. That's just something that so many times in my life, I have to recognize that myself because so many times in my life I've had that sense, there's something wrong here, and I didn't trust myself. And it turned out, if I listened, I would have kept some problems from happening. Okay? And so I believe that there are, you know, I don't have the gift of tongues. I don't have the gift of interpretation of tongues. Um, and so, and we're going to talk about some of the, the, the list before. So, shorter answer to your question. I believe that God, the Holy Spirit, does gift people with gifts, one or more, over a period of time. Doesn't mean he can't enable people with special abilities when that's needed. I do not believe, which you, you were asking, everybody has all the gifts that they access the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what Paul is saying right here. He's saying not everybody has all the gifts. No, that's Which, not what I'm saying. I know, but that would suggest to me that, that people don't have access to all the gifts. Meaning, if they have the Holy Spirit, they can access those gifts whenever needed. That's not the point. No, the, the point I was making was that he distributes those gifts through those willing vessels as the moment dictates right. by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that they have a free ATM card to go there and pull out whatever right. gift they want whenever they want. Right. And I think that's possible, but I think that, that in addition to that specialized enabling, the indication is that there are gifts that are given for long term, that God wants us to be servants in a particular kind of mode. Okay, Ken first, and then Mike. Uh, I, pardon me, I think you, you see both in the practice of Christianity. You, like, uh, you know, like you say, you have the gift of uh, discernment and then teaching that are just constant. That, that you know, there, there's something that's present in your life, but there's probably other times where all of a sudden there's something that is typically not you, but you're overwhelmed with the sense that this is something you need to do, and you find a special power that that was enabled at that particular time. Right. Uh, and I got, I just read a book where there was a Baptist preacher that was in a wreck. They declared him dead right there. 
and another Baptist preacher walked in and you know, he was stuck in the traffic, walked up to see what was going on, and of course these don't believe in healing or that kind of thing, and yet as he got there, he felt like the Lord wanted to pray for the man in the car who was declared dead, and he'd been in the car for over an hour. He went and prayed for him, and, and then and he said he'd never prayed like that in his life before, and he began to cry and okay. pray, and eventually, and all of a sudden he sang, and the guy started singing with him, and it shocked him. Hmm. Yeah. And he said it's well, never happened again. I, that's, you know? I think that's what I was saying, is that God, in a particular situation, the Holy Spirit can enable us miraculously to meet a need. That's not the same thing as when, you know, because Paul, I think, is clearly talking about that we are we are equipped in a way that is for the sake of the body ongoing, not just isolated instances. That doesn't mean, I, I, I fully believe the Holy Spirit can empower us as needed for special circumstances as well. Mike? The, the, the gift of prophecy, uh, there's an office of prophet which where you have the permanent gifting, if you will, as in the office. And then, the, then there's the gift of prophecy, which arises from time to time as, as the occasion occurs. Mm -hmm. So it's not, but, but to say that the prophecy that's talked about as the gift is constantly there. I, don't I think, think it is. Like, I think it's a gifting. The, the gift, uh, well, let's, let's look at the gifts that are listed, okay? Um, now, this is taken from 1 Corinthians 12 and from Romans 12. There is no hard and fast set list. There's no place where it says, here are the gifts. In fact, in the very midst of, of sort of listing them, he'll then say, he'll, Paul will kind of casually refer to something else. You know, well, if you're going to encourage, then encourage, you know, to the Lord. When he had listed encouragement as one of the gifts. But the, the gifts, as we do find them in these two locations, and you can, you know, there are others um, that, that we could find. Wisdom. The ability to know what's right and wrong, clearly. You know, the, the ability to perceive what is consistent with God's will and direction. The gift of knowledge, which is the ability to understand and the ability to, um, to learn. This is one, in my, my own experience, when I teach, and Carolyn's heard this many times, when I teach, I learned early on in teaching that if I over-prepare, you know, and, and I've got every everything set up, it falls flat. There are things that when I teach, recollections I have, things that come to my mind, things that I remember that I had not planned on, and that I would not have probably remembered if I was not in a teaching situation. And I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit, because I think it's Him who's called me to teach, that part of the knowledge is He gives me it gives me the ability to answer questions, for instance. He gives me the knowledge, uh, the remembrance of experiences that apply to those things. Um, I once did a Bible study in an, an Episcopal church full of very liberal people, and I was at that time I was rereading Mere Christianity. And I would come to a passage in Mere Christianity and go, you know, that's really good. And I would say, I'm, or some other book, there were several books involved in this. I'm going to take that with me to class tonight. And I have it under my chair. And somebody would ask a question, and I go, let me read you something. And it would be what I had highlighted or, you know, or tagged that day. That, you know, knowledge doesn't mean you know everything. It means that I believe the Holy Spirit works through you to provide knowledge. It can come through recollection. It can come through learning. It can come through memorization. It can come a lot, a lot of different ways. But the Spirit works in that. I don't take credit, you know, when I'm when I'm successful in the teaching, because I really do believe that that's what the Spirit's calling me to do, and He enables that. John? That really confirms what Paul says here, because Paul is not identifying only wisdom and knowledge. He's talking about the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge, right. which is not an innate knowledge of myself. It mm -hmm. is something to be uttered into a circumstance. For the to, sake of the body. For the sake of the body, for the welfare of others. Uh -huh. Right. Then there is faith. Now, everybody, some of these things, everybody has some amount of. We all have faith or we wouldn't be believers. But there's a kind of faith that goes beyond. There's a kind of faith that will dare great things because they have the assurance beyond what most people are able to, to muster that God can do those things. So there's a kind of faith that is a miraculous gift of the Spirit beyond what most of us have. Um, there is a gift of healing. The ability to, uh, to meet 
in a miraculous way the physical needs of the body. Now, some of these, unfortunately, I firmly believe that healing happens. It happens in response to prayer. I believe certain people, sometimes we refer to those people as prayer warriors. People who seem, by their own spiritual maturity or whatever other way, seem to have the ability to be especially efficacious when they pray. Their prayers are answered. And often those are prayers for healing. And so I believe that healing is a very real thing. I've known groups that got so, you know, it's like, he's going to lengthen her leg, let's all watch, kind of thing. <laughs> That's not the point. That's not what this is all about. But healing is real. It's not something that, um, I think, I've, I've, some healing happens through doctors. It is God who gives us the knowledge and wisdom to be able to treat illness as well. Some of it happens miraculously. We believe in both. Miracles, in addition to miraculous, uh, to miraculous healing, there are other kinds of miracles, which again are often the product of prayer. Yes, Lynn? Just want to go back to healing for a minute. Um, I was trained as a nurse in a very forward-thinking institution, and they taught us that the body mind and spirit were integrated and when we had problems in one part of those aspects of us we became ill and so there was a difference between healing and curing. I might not be able to cure your cancer but I can help you to heal, to restore your um, integration of those body parts so that your body uh, can do what it has to do to the best of its ability. Right, okay. Uh, so um, healing there is really does have a huge spiritual symptom. Yeah, I, I, well, and I, I think that's true, but here we're talking about miraculous by the gift of the Holy Spirit healing. Okay? Where, like, through the laying on of hands, there is a miraculous healing of the illness or, or something else. Um, so, miracles and then prophecy. Again, this doesn't mean telling the future. Now, uh, prophecies sometimes do. But this is prophecy, which means to speak the word of the Lord. A prophet, even in the Old Testament, was not necessarily one who told the future, but rather one who spoke for God. So this is this, this gets into, we're going to talk about teaching and some other things. Preaching, teaching, any of those who are called and enabled by the Spirit to speak the word of God to those who need to hear. Okay? There is discernment, or distinguishing of spirits, as it's called, um, which is the ability to tell right from wrong, true from false, to tell whether somebody is, is what they appear to be or not. Now, distinguishing of spirits, in some cases, there actually are evil spirits involved. In some cases, it's just some people are more given over to evil. And again, I've gotten myself in trouble when I haven't listened too much to what I had a sense of, that there's something wrong here. And yet, not, you know, not having enough faith in the spirit speaking to me or my own understanding, whatever, I've gone ahead with something and it hasn't turned out well. I believe that that's, um, that's a very real thing. Tongues. This is the ability to speak in other tongues. In the book of Acts, it involves speaking in tongues that other people could understand that those the people who spoke them had never been taught. There is also a sense in which there are prayer languages. Clearly Paul is talking about that. Indecipherable languages given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that cannot be understood unless someone has the next gift, which is interpretation of tongues. To be able to say what that means, what is being said, as a way of providing that as a word uh, of, of encouragement or knowledge or understanding to the body. There then is teaching. Now all of these are listed in here. Um, teaching helps or service. The idea of someone simply by their efforts. When someone, people who with a good heart and a positive spirit and encouragement and energy wash the dishes, or take out the trash. There are people who do that on a regular basis. That is listed as a spiritual gift. The gift of helps. That they have a spirit of joy in doing those kinds of things that most other people grumble about. There is the gift of encouragement. The ability to encourage others. To make them feel positive. Okay. Chris has the gift of encouragement. <laughs> he, all the time. I get emails from him. The sense in which I feel encouraged and strengthened by that. I mean, I, I probably should go around and talk to other of you about your gifts, but that's one that just jumped, and I've told him that, that he has the gift of encouragement, and I really benefit and appreciate that. Uh, the gift of giving. Now again, like 
the gift of faith, everybody can give. But the gift of giving is the miraculous Holy Spirit given ability to give um, exceptionally, to give joyfully, and to give in ways that really benefit. Okay? Um, to be able to pray and know that what you're giving to is the right thing, and to be able to do so without the kind of worries that people often have about, well, you know, maybe I should keep that because I could have a problem and the stock market's down two points today, or whatever it is. The gift of giving is a miraculous ability to open your heart and your purse in faith and to be able to contribute in ways that are blessed. The gift of leadership is listed. Uh, the idea of being able to lead in the way that God desires, in a way that's honoring to the body and achieves God's will, and the gift of mercy, the ability to show compassion. Now again, we can all show compassion, we can all show mercy, but there's an aspect to which there is a miraculous sense of compassion that some people have in showing gifts of mercy. Now, there are others. You'll notice I don't have the gift of hospitality on here, but it's mentioned in one place. Um, there are other kinds of gifts. In fact, this is sort of consistent with the idea that the Holy Spirit provides gifts. He can provide special enabling for a special circumstance, but the Holy Spirit can provide whatever gift the body happens to need. And part of it is that we have to have faith in that. We have to have faith that that's going to be provided for and move forward boldly on these things. Um, I think it's critically important for all of us to learn something about what our own gifts are. Usually, as I say, it has to do with what your natural inclinations are. In most cases, <clears throat> if God gives you the gift of gab, then you, you know, I actually kissed the Blarney Stone, by the way. I don't know if you, I've ever said that. Uh, in Ireland, but if you have the ability to speak, um, you know, off the top of your head or whatever, then teaching or preaching, those kinds of gifts are probably what the Holy Spirit is going to provide you. Although, remember, not always. Sometimes He will take us in the other direction in order to show His power and in order to be able to use us. Uh, if you, you know, if you love to entertain people in your home, if you love to make people feel welcome and feel comfortable, then you may well have the gift of hospitality. If you really feel drawn to care for the needs of people who are hurting, then you may have the gift of mercy or compassion. I think we need to be more aware of how the Holy Spirit has gifted us because only by being a little more aware of that are we then effectively able to utilize them. I think, and there are tests you can take that will give you kind of an indication. Uh, I, I've tried very hard, prayerfully, to figure out what gifts do I have and what gifts don't I have because it's not productive for me to try to do things that are not within, not in my wheelhouse. It's not what the Spirit has, neither how God made me, nor is it how the Spirit has especially equipped me. It is important to understand, though, that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are presented not as just natural abilities, but as supernatural abilities that God gives us to meet the needs of the body and to serve others. Okay? Questions about any of that? Uh, Judy first and then Faith. Is there, um, I was watching on the on History Channel, the, this church, they were talking about miracles, and, and there's a church that had all these snakes, and they was, you know, they... <coughs> the Science Church, they call them the, themselves the followers of science. And they were, they would dance around and they were in communists, they said, and that was it. And two of the <laughs> pastors, were, were uh, died from. Yep. One had the finger mm -hmm. touched and yeah. from these well, snakes. Is there a there, there's name? No, there's not. And there's two, and two, fire. two points we need to make about that. One, the part about taking up poisonous snakes and drinking poison and not being hurt is from a passage in Mark that every scholar who is a scholar will tell you that's not part of the, you know, it's not any of the early manuscripts. It's not part of Mark. In addition to that, Jesus, when he was being tempted the desert, in the desert, very plainly said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when I drink poison or I take up a poisonous snake, if that's not tempting God, I don't know what is. God doesn't have to prove himself to me. God doesn't have to miraculously. Now, if I get Paul, for instance, and they refer to the fact that Paul, when he was on Cyprus, Cyprus or Crete, one of the two, when he was bitten by a snake, he was piled out of the fire with a star of fire, and this serpent, a deadly serpent, bit him on the hand. And he shook it off in the fire, but everybody said, oh, he's a goner. Boy, he's going to be dead. Nothing happened to him. That's not the same thing as going looking for snakes. 
okay? So no, we do not believe that. We believe that is testing or tempting the Lord our God. We don't believe the primary passage that's based on is part of the scripture, or uh, you know, the original text of the scripture. I don't know who, who added it or why it got added, but in fact, if you look at any good Bible, any, any good translation of the Bible, it will have that section separate, and so, or they will highlight it and say, this is not in any of the early manuscripts. Okay? Okay? How do you answer someone who said, well, I don't have those gifts, but I'm going to ask God to give them to me so I can do it? <laughs> well, you can ask God to give you gifts. But now, the attitude of the heart is... The attitude of the heart is critically important. You're absolutely right. That was the next thing I was going to say. Paul says, eagerly sit, uh, seek the greater gifts. Elsewhere he says prophecy is the greatest of gifts, the ability to speak the word of God. Um, wisdom is highly listed. So the greatest of the gifts are the ones in which the focus is truly what God's will is and what God says. And so somebody who says, you know, boy, I'm going to be great. I'm going to have it. Well, God's not going to honor that anyway. So that's not the right approach. But that doesn't mean that we cannot ask God to give us gifts. Paul says that. He really seek the greater gifts. So there's nothing wrong with asking, but you, I think any time you approach God and ask for something, you need to ask yourself first, what's the motivation of my heart? And if it's if it's selfish, if it's for showiness, if it's make people have people pay attention to me, then then that's a bad idea. John, first. You know what what this this all this thing about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and I've walked several years in an intimacy with this, so this is not. I enjoy this, but what I see. What I see with this that's so astounding is it's clear demonstration that we need each other. Mm -hmm. You yeah. go to chapter 14 and it talks about that I can't say, I, I don't need the hand or whatever. You know? And when you look at this and you look at God's economy, how he demonstrates himself within his elect people, his church, right. that just to me underscores the, the need that we have for one another. Absolutely. And, and you know, I don't mean I don't mean accepting the ex extreme those those uh, strange uh, uh, imitations and, and exceptions, but the valid and the and the the the, the legitimate gifts we need them. So right, absolutely. And when someone who is part of the body of faith does not join together with the other believers, does not use their gift in service to the body that the body lacks. And the Holy Spirit can miraculously make up for it. Of course, that person then does not have the blessing of being able to be part of the body and contribute to it. But when someone who has been gifted by the Spirit to meet a need in the body then refuses to participate with the body, the body suffers. That all demonstrates to be community. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, I just don't see it there. It's probably there somewhere. But Michelangelo and comes to mind and that some people can create the most beautiful picture, painting or poetry or whatever. Right. I could see poetry kind of wisdom and knowledge, but painting. Well, um, where's painting fit in there? That, that <laughs> skill, if you want. Or does it? Or is that miraculous? It may not. I mean, it may simply be a natural gift. I mean, there are some terrifically talented natural artists, singers, whatever, who clearly are not people of God who have not accepted Christ and therefore do not have the Holy Spirit working in them. So there are natural abilities. That's why I've said several times we need to make sure we differentiate between natural abilities and the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, I think that, that based upon Scripture, you know, David, God anointed certain people under David to provide for the beauty of the temple, for instance. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure where it fits in there. Maybe that's what we don't have on the list. Maybe the ability to create beauty also, and again, there is some scriptural suggestion of that in terms of God, God being the one that caused to be selected and then sort of anointed and, and directed those who created the beauty of the temple. So perhaps so. But again, there are people who are very talented who create things that are very attractive that are not because of the Holy Spirit. Other questions or comments? It's not wrong to say that's not my gift if there is a need. No, absolutely. It's, it's, in fact, you should. There's nothing that will make you... There's not, there are two things that will make you the most miserable in your Christian life. I promise you. One is not using the gift you've been given. 
If you are gifted and you don't use it, you will not be happy in your Christian walk. The second thing that will make you miserable is trying to use a gift that's not yours. Okay? Um, how many of you feel you have the gift of preaching? I want to make a list. Okay. Some of you, I know that that's true. Um, some of the others of you, the reason you didn't raise your hand is because you would be mortified to give. They say that public speaking is the number one fear amongst Americans, at least, more than anything else, more than the fear of death, is the fear of public speaking. And that's the majority of people. Now, clearly, if you're one of those people that is scared to death, unless God you know, really particularly anoints you in the opposite direction, then probably that's not a gift. And if you try to exercise that gift, you're going to hate it. You're going you're gonna to die inside every time you try to do that. So don't try to assume a gift that you don't have. Or feel guilty if you say no. Or feel guilty if you say no. Absolutely. John? One other thing, too, is that, that his gifts, uh, I've discovered, they're not a big secret. No. You can, you can know. You can ask them. You can know. And you can discover what these are to then follow what you, those two things that you were talking right. about. It's not, it's not something just reserved for super, super high people, you know, or anything like that. It's for people whose hearts are rendered, and he can, he's quite capable of communicating what his purpose for you is. Right. I said earlier that I thought we all needed to have some concern for identifying what our gifts were and what our gifts weren't. Um, and I think another thing is that we can be very important in the lives of other believers by encouraging and affirming gifts in them. Exactly. You know, gift of encouragement. Um, the yeah, Carolyn has a gift of evangelism, and she struggles against oh, it. <laughs> we've talked. We've talked about that. Um, she she seems to keep stumbling into situations with people, the last people in the world you would think would want to be Christians, and yet they express a real interest in her. So I'm, I'm always sort of joking about that. But the idea is being able to affirm gifts in others. That you have the gift of hospitality, you have the gift of mercy and compassion, you have the gift of encouragement. You know, you have the gift of you know some of them like tongues or interpretation of tongues probably either they're, they're using those gifts or they're not. Encouragement's not going to make a huge di difference. But um, I think that the, many of these are things we can encourage in each other. I think that's an important part of bringing them out for the sake of the body and for the person to feel joy and satisfaction. It's a confirmation too. It mm -hmm. is.